there is now what we would refer to in our field as a wealth of choices, okay? We had, 20 years ago, no real choices for safe, effective treatment of relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis. We used big guns for this disease. We used chemotherapy. We used total body irradiation because there was knowledge about the causation being a problem with the immune system attacking the nervous system. So the bottom line was we gunned down the immune system in, or in order to effectively lessen the damages. But that was a very dangerous way to treat the disease. That was a way of treating MS that put the patient at risk for multiple complications. But then life changed. And life changed in a good way because we got the first of the drugs, the interferons, then we got Copaxone, and now we had an armament of choices to use for relapsing disease that was non-toxic. That doesn't mean no side effects, but simply that we had options to use that impacted on how frequent people would have relapses, on how severe those relapses would be, and how the disease might progress, and we could administer the, those therapies knowing that we were not gonna put the, the patient at risk for damage to their other organ systems, for toxicity, which is what that means, okay? So, there are three forms, as you see on the screen here, of relapsing disease in MS. The first is the classic relapsing remitting. People have an attack of neurologic defect, it stays for a while, then they get a little better, maybe all the way better. Sometime later, six months, a year later, another attack. And so it goes, attack and then healing, attack and then healing, and that's the way the disease begins in 85% of our, our patients and pro progresses that way over a number of years. But there are two other relapsing forms of MS as delineated here. There's something we refer to as secondary progressive MS, which means someone who's had relapsing remitting MS for a period of time enters a phase of the disease in which slowly but surely they're getting worse, but there's no obvious attack. There's no sudden defect that gets better, but instead just a slow loss. And we recognize now that about 50 to 75% of people with relapsing MS, relapsing remitting, untreated, will enter that secondary progressive phase. And that's another thing that our new drugs were able to do. We discovered that by treating people early and treating people with these platform therapies, we could offset the development of that secondary stage. But even people who are in secondary progressive MS, in fact, are still having relapses some of the time. And so we still refer to that as a relapsing form of MS. And it's not like you go from relapsing remitting, you know, day 10 and day 11, you're a secondary progressive and now we stop your drugs. Not at all. We know that there's this overlap period in which people with classic relapsing remitting are now moving into secondary progressive disease and yet we still want to administer therapies that will be effective for relapsing and the drugs on the market now, including the new ones, are all indicated for that form of relapsing disease. The third one we call progressive relapsing. That's a much lesser occurring form of MS in which there is insidious progression from the get-go. It doesn't start with attacks. It starts with this slow progressive and it looks for all the world like what, what our fourth type of disease is, is called primary progressive, and primary progressive has no relapses ever. But progressive relapsing is a form of slowly progressive in which every so often there's an acute attack. And it looks for all the world like a classic relapse where the patient gets worse and then the patient gets better. And so knowing that we have these three different relapsing forms, all of those types of, of patients have been included in the clinical trial for our new drugs. And so these trials suggest that whichever form of relapsing disease you have, you may be a candidate for one of these newer drugs, including the platform drugs that came out in the 1990s, our original injectable agent. 
here are the classic. We're going to do some lists now, okay? Here are the FDA-approved disease-modifying drugs, what we call the first-line injectable drugs, and these are our old friends, interferons and glutaramiracetate, which is Copaxone. And interferons come in three different sizes and shapes, right? We have interferon beta-1b, which is uh, beta-seron. There's also a new uh, released form of that by Novartis, which is identical, called Extavia. We have the interferon 1As, two forms of that, Avonex, injected once a week uh, in the muscle. And then we have Rebif, which is injected subcutaneously three times a week. And then finally, we have Copaxone, very good drug, but injected daily. And so all of those are the drugs that we all go, ugh, because they're needles, right? Yes. 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 <laughs> the audience agrees. Here are our new first line oral drugs. And that oral has a wonderful sound to it. There are three of them as of, of now, just in this last year, we've had two <coughs> added on to the list. Uh, Fingolimod or Gelenia, which was originally released on the market three years ago. Teraflunamide, known as Obagio, which came up about one year ago. And then just in the last six months, Tecfidera, which is dimethyl fumarate, was added to the list. And all three orals, work differently. They all have different mechanisms by which they interfere with the immune dysfunction of MS. They all work well for, for all populations with MS, so it's not like the studies showed only women would respond to one or only older people would respond to another. They cut across that whole spectrum. But bear in mind, what we never quite know yet is which of our MS patients will best respond to which of these drugs. And so that really is the conundrum that inspired me to think about doing this talk, is how do we choose? How do we know which drug to give to which patient? And I'm not saying I have the answer. I'm not gonna even give you all the answers tonight because we don't know the answers. What I wanna do tonight is pr propose the questions. What are the important questions we need to be asking? Now we have also some additional therapies that are not considered first line. So a first line therapy is a therapy that the FDA has approved for use in patients with any of the relapsing forms as a first therapy for that patient. And you say, oh good, we never have to take a shot again as a first therapy. Hold your horses, okay? Because just because a drug has the designation as being a first line therapy doesn't mean we're gonna use it first. Because again, our older drugs are well known. Our platform injectable drugs of 20 years duration are good friends of ours. We know the ups and downs of them, we know the side effects, and we know, we know the drug-drug interactions of them, and so there's a good sense of safety with those older drugs. These newer drugs, both the first-line orals that I was just mentioning to you, um, and these second-line drugs, are not as well-known quantities. We're getting to know them, but as you know, in the world at large, experience with the drug speaks, speaks a lot to us. Knowing which patient will do well on a drug, it takes time to know those things, and there are often unknown toxicities which become evident over time as a drug is used on the market. So besides the first-line drugs, we have these drugs which are referred to as second-line. And specifically, the FDA is not suggesting that a 20-year-old who walks in with their first attack of MS should be started on a drug like natalizumab, Tysabri, or mitoxantrum, Novantrum. And the reason these drugs are second line is because although they have very potent positive effects on the disease, they also have now well-defined toxicities which could lead to other organ system injury. And in fact, in our center, we've pretty much abandoned mitoxantrum, novantrum, which was a very good drug, very effective for relapsing forms of MS. But over time, we came to recognize that it had two major toxicities. One of them was cardiac toxicity. It injured the heart muscle. The second was secondary cancer in the form of leukemia. And although that was only a 1% incidence, would you get on a plane that had a one out of 100 chance of going down? I don't think so. So that's no small incidence 
of a very bad disease as a complication of Novantrum. So that one is, is very low on our list of use now. Tysabri, on the other hand, is highly used, and it's used because it's incredibly effective. It's a once a month IV, so it kind of takes you at least away from the daily or every other day injections. But the problem with Tysabri, as many of you well know, is that there also has been a toxicity that's been identified with Tysabri, which is the development of a brain infection with a virus called the JC virus, which can occur infrequently, but still can occur in patients on, on this drug for their MS. And frankly, if you get the disease caused by this virus, known as PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, the outcome of that is not very good. It's additional handicap, or at its worst, it's, it's death. So knowing that toxicity definitely puts the Tysabri into its place as a second line agent. We are only going to use that in patients in whom we've identified aggressive disease that is not responding to safer therapies, okay? So there are some sort of choice algorithms, if you will. An algorithm is a pathway. Do this first, do that second, do that third. We all use algorithms in our daily life, right? We get, we get a rash and we go, well, I'm gonna try cortisone ointment first, and if that doesn't work, I'm gonna put the Neosporin on it, and if that doesn't work, then maybe I'll go to my doctor, right? So we all use pathways and we all do that in our decision making in multiple areas of our life every day. That's what you go to an MS specialist for though because that MS specialist hopefully is expert at moving you through the appropriate pathways to manage your disease. Um, and I, I, you know, stories are always good ways of telling it. And I had some cases in this, in this talk which we don't have time for today. But just one little anecdote. I saw a lady today who's on her seventh MS therapy. Okay, seventh. And as I looked at the list, we had very good reasons over a period of now probably 15 years of moving her from one drug to another to another. And right now she's very comfortable on the drug she is on, but as her MS, MS doctor, her treater, I'm very unhappy with the level of disability she has. And I think to myself, okay, but what if, what if we had none of those therapies? What if, in fact, we had let her disease just run its course? She can still walk, she can still talk, they were heading out on a trip to see grandchildren. So really, she has a pretty substantial good quality of life, although it is much less than I would have liked it to be in terms of what her defects are. So we have choices. We have pathways. We are, we are developing new pathways to figure out what's the best way to move people through this disease to keep them safest and to retain their quality of life and their neurologic function, obviously. Okay, now there are other choices. You know, so when, when you go into your doctor and you've got the flyers from all the new stuff, in your doctor's head, there are also these older choices, and there are certain settings in which we fall back to a list of medications that are more in the immune suppressive realm rather than in the disease modifying therapy. We call our new therapies disease modifying. We also call them immune modulating therapies because in general, what they do is they pick off one little piece of the immune pathway so that your autoimmune dysregulation, the, the abnormal way in which your immune system is, is acting in MS, can be interrupted. That's what disease-modifying therapies do. What they don't do is shoot all the, all, the, all the participants in the immune system. That's what I said we did 25 years ago and 30 years ago. Nevertheless, this is a short list of immune-suppressive drugs that keep finding their way back into the MS literature. Why? because they have effects. They have some positive effects. And sometimes we use these drugs in patients with more progressive diseases. Sometimes we fall back to these drugs because the standard ones have not worked for a given patient. Sometimes because those aren't tolerated. But I imagine as we move forward in the realm of new MS therapies, that these drugs that are generally immune suppressive, meaning they basically kill immune system cells, I think are gonna gradually fall away from our lists. 
And corticosteroids, I just list that at the top because, hey, we still use those for acute attacks. We still use those to try to restore function. But corticosteroids ultimately have only been a Band-Aid for MS. They have really not changed the progression of the disease. And so I think we're looking forward to a time when those fall off the list as well. Hopefully because nobody's having attacks, but even more hopefully because we have something better to restore function after an attack. Okay, what about things that are coming? And I just show you this list because the game is still going, okay? Don't believe that we've reached a panacea just because we have these new drugs. There are a lot of medications that are in the MS pipeline. Um, so there are agents that are anti-inflammatory. Tecfidera, one of our new orals, is considered such an agent, anti-inflammatory. So it dials down the pro-inflammatory items in the immune attack. There are certain proteins, cytokines, that are pro-inflammatory. There are certain cells that are pro-inflammatory. And so anti-inflammatory therapies are still under study, and liquinamide is one of them. Then there are a number of, and I only mention one here, of sphingosine receptor blockade agents that are in the pipeline. What one do we have now? Gelenia is a sphingosine receptor analog or agonist, meaning it mimics a molecule in your body called sphingosine. And sphingosine has a lot of different functions that it does, but one of the things that it does is it guides white blood cells out of lymph nodes. And so when you take fingolimod, that is gelenia, it substitutes itself for sphingosine, and the white blood cells can go into the lymph node, but they can't get out. So it messes up white blood cell GPS, if you will, hmm. okay? And so you have fewer of those white blood cells circulating. Well, it turns out that that is a very effective mechanism for MS. And so there are several second generation sphingosine receptor blockers like fingolimod, like gelenia, that are under study. Ono is one of them. Um, we also have new variations on old themes. So what's pegylated Avonex? Pegylated Avonex is a long-acting Avonex. You take it twice a month, injected under the skin, not in the muscle. So it's a twice a month sub-Q. Hey, that's pretty good, all right? Then there is double-dose Copaxone, which is up in front of the FDA now. What does that mean? That's a glatiramer acetate identical to Copaxone that's given three times a week instead of daily, but it's given at twice the dose. And right now the FDA is reviewing the new study data on that agent. And then there are a whole list of antibodies. Natalizumab, Tysabri, is a humanized monoclonal antibody, meaning it's a mouse substance that's that they fix in the test tube to look more like human antibody that you inject in the patient and it binds somewhere. In the case of natalizumab, it binds onto white blood cells to keep them from entering the brain and the spinal cord, right? But all these others, ocrelizumab binds on B cells, diclizumab binds on another um, interleukon, Al alumtuzumab is something that is up before the FDA now that when it's marketed will be called Lentrata, and it has another binding site as well. All of these antibodies are designed, again, to interrupt a particular step in the abnormal immune pathway. And they work differently. So the truth is, in the future, I want to be able to have a patient come in, identify their MS as MS. I'd like to have a blood test I can draw and tell me which kind of immune dysfunction do they have in their MS. And therefore, I will be able to pick out the exact right drug and tell them, this is the drug for you, this is going to stop your MS. We're not there yet. But we're looking for markers like that in patients. A lot of these studies are doing genetic um, analysis that is analyzing markers in the blood and on the immune system cells to see who best responds. Because at the end of a trial, let's say you have a great response at the end of a trial, and 50% of the people do better. You want to know, of those 50% that did better, what do they have different in their immune system than the 50% of people who didn't do better? 
And those kinds of markers are really going to be the way we guide therapy in the future. This list is just for your amusement. Well, it was really for my amusement. OK. Because it lists things that don't necessarily work, but people are playing with. LDN is a, a narcotic thing we use to reverse opiate drugs. Low dose naltrexone is what it is. There's a lot of popular fad data that says it works for 10 different diseases. Always be wary of something that works for MS and also nine other diseases. And doxycycline, an antibiotic, there's been some study of doxycycline. It has an anti-inflammatory effect. So there may, may be some veracity in that. Cannabinoids, everybody who's ever been in an MS trial that involved smoking marijuana felt better. Um, CCS, <laughs> there was no objective data that they were better, but they felt better, and so on and so forth. So there are lists that you all have. There are lists on the internet. There are all kinds of lists. But my goal is to tell you about the stuff that's been well studied and that we're trying to choose amongst when we're treating your MS. So how's a girl or boy to choose? You got to know the options. You need to work closely with somebody who understands these drugs. And you, you have to ask the right questions. So the three key questions that I'm going to address in the remainder of this talk are, when should MS treatment really begin? Which therapy is optimal and for which patient, as far as we know right now? And what guides us in that way? And when should treatment changes be given in a certain patient on a certain treatment? When should treatment begin? There is now data that says first attack. Even if you don't meet the criteria for a definite MS diagnosis, if you have risk for MS, meaning you've had optic neuritis or a spinal cord attack or a one-time double vision thing, and you've got a couple spots on your brain scan that look suspicious, you are at risk. And we have studies that say people like that treated early do better. Treat them before you even can make a firm diagnosis of MS. If you come in and you already meet the criteria for MS diagnosis, time to start therapy. So the moment we have a firm MS diagnosis in someone, someone comes in with not just first attack, but they really meet the criteria, we treat. And then we are even beginning to think about treating people who have RIS. What's RIS? That's somebody who has an MRI scan that they were unfortunate enough to have done because they went to the ER with a headache and some well-meaning ER physician gets an MRI and they don't have anything traumatic, they're not bleeding in their head, but lo and behold, they have classic changes of MS. So if you have an MS scan, but you in fact have never had a symptom of MS yet in your life, you're still at risk. And there's some data suggesting that people like that may warrant being started on an MS drug. So that's the rationale. I don't want to go through all the detail on the slide, but the rationale is that there are these trials for clinically isolated syndrome. These were all trials of the original MS drugs. Avonex, Betaseron, Copaxone, all got trialed in patients who'd had a single attack, and it showed there was a delay to when they would have their next attack and therefore have MS. And if you looked at them years out, the people who got started early versus people who were simply followed until their next attack had less disability a couple of years later. So the bottom line is early treatment benefits from very early, okay? And then of course, all of our pivotal MS trials, that is the basic trials we had for beta seron, Avonex, Rebif, et cetera, proved that the earlier you treated, the more aggressively you treated by keeping people on therapy, the better they were likely doing years later, okay? So there is this early window of, of optimal treatment, which, you know, if you've had your disease 40 years, yes, you, there was no way anybody could treat you that early because these drugs didn't exist. But it's a new world now for people with new disease. Is there any exception to the early rule? Yes, there's an exception here, benign MS. That's hard to identify. It's benign if 30 years into your disease, you're neurologically completely normal. But I don't know that when you walk in the door. So a lot of things that were called benign really turn out not to be benign. If you have a first attack and you get numb down one side, and then six weeks later you're normal, 
You might think you're benign, but the bottom line is the disease plays out over years. And 90% plus of people with MS are not going to be benign. So the odds are in favor of treating early and not making an exception. How about not MS? Yes. Is this the right diagnosis? Recently I had a, a gal in the hospital with a bad spinal cord attack and it was time to rethink her disease because the, the, spinal, the lesion on the spinal cord MRI looked much longer and the spinal cord was much more swollen than we see in typical MS. So I sent off a, a blood test called the NMO antibody. NMO is an MS lookalike disease, neuromyelitis optica it's called. And for, for centuries, for certainly for a long time, we thought NMO was just another form of MS and we treated it with MS drugs. And lo and behold, it came back positive and she is now on a different drug because NMO in fact is not MS and it responds to other drugs. So we always wanna make sure the diagnosis is right. We wanna make sure that, that we're, we're covering people early on in their course. We don't wanna call things benign that are not. And finally, if it's a progressive form of the disease, sometimes that's hard to know right at the beginning, particularly in that form I mentioned before, progressive relapsing. So frankly, sometimes we overtreat. Sometimes we start people with progressive MS on drugs for relapsing, and then we have to backpedal a little bit later. But since we have more options for relapsing disease, I'd rather make an error in that direction than to undertreat somebody who ends up having a relapsing form. Okay, question number two is, which is the optimal therapy? I always say it's the one you're gonna take. If, you, if you're not gonna take it, I don't wanna give you that therapy. But we do not have, these are the challenges, these are the painful truths. We don't have guidelines to tell us which patient should have which drug and in what order they should be treated. Um, there's some false thinking these days because we have new drugs. There are people who are saying, well, the older drugs are the weaker drugs. We don't want to use those. They're weaker because they're older. That's not actually true. We don't have a lot of side-to-side -side comparative trials yet of our injectable drugs with our newer, newer oral drugs. So just being new doesn't necessarily make it stronger or better. And again, as I said before, we don't have biomarkers. I don't have a blood test to draw to tell me that patient A is going to respond to drug B. And in the future, maybe we will, but not now. So those are the painful truths that I have to live with. The other confounder here is that first attack MS is not always early disease. So I just talked to you about treating early, treating early, treating early. And I have people who walk in with their first attack and I find out when I talk to them that really 10 years ago they had some optic neuritis, but nobody recognized it. Or 10 years ago their legs went numb and they went to their chiropractor and after six weeks of treatment they got all better and they knew it was a chiropractic problem. That's an MS attack, right? An MS attack that wasn't recognized as MS. So sometimes when people walk in the door finally with a new attack and they get a diagnosis of MS, they've got a scan that's already loaded with lesions. And I'm behind. I'm already behind in their treatment. And that's unfortunate, but we work with that and we treat, okay? So what are the signs that we're behind? One is that there's a large MRI burden of disease. There are a lot of plaques there. Um, another thing that puts us behind sometimes or tells us that we're dealing with a more severe version of the disease is when people begin with motor paralysis or double vision. Um, and then there are certain patients who have a higher risk, who have a higher risk of, of getting bad disease. And those include men more than women, African Americans more than Caucasians, and people who start the disease at older age. And I used to say older age was anything over 30, but that's when I was 20. <laughs> older age now is, you know, older than me. But, um, <laughs> but yes, there are people who start in their 50s and 60s with this disease. Okay. So again, first presentation is not always the beginning of the disease, as I've said here. We simply miss the beginning. Um, we do want to identify aggressive disease early on. Why? Because we're going to be more aggressive with our treatment. So I'm going to be less tolerant 
of first drug failure in somebody with aggressive disease. I'm going to want to move to another drug more quickly in somebody whose disease is exploding. So we may use natalizumab. I told you it's a second line treatment. We might opt to use that in a patient whose disease looks like it's going to be more aggressive. Um, and remember that if we start with an aggressive therapy, that does not preclude what we call de-escalating. So we might start with a, a Tysabri therapy for a patient whose disease looks aggressive, but if they have a high risk for PML in two years when their disease has been under control for a while, we might drop back to a first-line agent that has less toxicity. So we're not absolutely precluded from going in the opposite direction than what we usually would for using these, these agents. Okay, and do we have data that tells us which therapy is optimal for which patient? Can we compare? Do we have any comparison trials? Well, we have some. In the first years of the disease-modifying drugs, we were given some comparisons between beta interferon 1b with Avonex and then later Rebiv with Avonex. So there are some comparisons that have taken place that showed us that higher dose, higher frequency interferon was in fact a little more effective. There were also several trials of Copaxone versus interferon, high dose, high frequency interferon, and in the end those came out fairly equivalent. So if you have failed on one of those, it's not unreasonable to move from a glatirimer to an interferon because it has a different mechanism of action. And in fact, for you as an individual, it may end up working better than the first one you chose, but you can be assured that in large groups, the two groups of agents work about the same. So that's helpful. There was also a combination trial, Avonex versus Copaxone versus both of them together. And in fact, that showed us that there was no advantage of taking the two at once. And that was an important question to answer because there had been clinicians mixing the two for a number of years in the absence of ev any evidence that that would help, thinking, well, if one is good and the other is good together, they must be better. And in fact, that was not the case. What about our new orals? Do we have any head-to-head -head comparison data between the new orals and the older injectables? And the truth is very limited. One trial of teraflunamide, Obagio, compared it to Rebif, and the two were comparable, but there was some criticism of how that study was structured because the end game was if you failed from an MS perspective, that was considered, you know, time to go off the drug. But if you didn't tolerate the drug, that was also considered drug failure. And they added those two things together. Those are two different things, failing in terms of your MS versus not liking the fact that your hair is thinning on Obagio. So there are people who have criticized that comparison trial. Um, Jelenia was compared to Avonex in a well-structured trial, and Jelenia did beat Avonex. So that is one very good head-to-head -head comparison trial. So you say, doctor, how will you pick the right drug for me? And here's my funny slide. No, it's not based on the colors of the branding and on the fancy things they put in the packaging. It's not going to be based on the fact that you tell me your sister liked drug A and you want to be on drug A because your MS is just like your sister's or just like your friend or just like your cousin's. Each one of you is individual and each one of you may respond differently to these medications. And it's not going to be based on the fact of what your insurance company wants me to order, even though I fight with them all the time to get them to pay for what I want to order. Um, and no, it's not going to be because you looked it up on WebMD. What it really has to be is based on reasonable data. So we have to look at your disease pattern. Are we early in your disease or are we late in your disease? We have to say, is your disease mild in its behavior or do we see signs of aggressivity of your disease? What really is your prognosis? How, how risky should we be with selection of therapy for you? And then we have to consider life issues. Are you currently pregnant or gonna become pregnant even when you say you're not gonna become pregnant? Is there that possibility? Um, are you able to self-inject or are you gonna rely on your husband or partner to inject you from now until forever? That's a big burden on somebody else. 
And what are your other diseases? Do you have heart disease? Well, we might not want you on Gelenia. Do you have diabetes? We might not want you on something else. So we have to look at all of the other life issues that affect a patient in order to try to pick best therapies for a given individual. Okay, and also, and I think I'm gonna end here because you, you guys have more things to do this evening, but you have to also pick therapy based not only on what I think, the doctor, but what your own life preferences are. You have to have an input and I have to have an input and it really has to be an alliance between you and your caregiver. Because if you're not both on board, it isn't gonna go well, right? You have to be reasonable, uh, willing and, and able, I should say, not reasonable, willing and able to do whatever, whatever pre-testing and ongoing safety testing that a particular drug needs. You have to be invested in thinking that your doctor really is picking the right therapy for you, right? You have to be comfortable that you can stay compliant because the biggest failure of MS treatment in MS is not taking the drug. Had somebody in the office yesterday, are you taking your Copaxone? Yes. Well, I take one day off a weekend. I just give myself a little break. And then the partner says, and I was in the hospital for four days, so he couldn't take it for those four days. So compliance is defined differently from patient to patient. So I ask all these questions because really, once you're on board with a drug, with your partner, your caregiver, you want to really be sure that you are signed up, taking the drug, and so the measurements that we make for effectiveness of the drug, has the drug obliterated relapses? Has the drug obliterated new MRI lesions? And has the drug prevented progression of your disability? If it's doing all of that and you are actually taking that drug, then we've got a great alliance going and we're gonna have effective therapy. And so with that, I'm gonna end, pause. Thank you.